Chairman, let me say that I'm honored to be invited amongst the over 3 million Liberian people to be part of this historic undertaking. I believe that the truth of what has kept us behind and what has what led us to conflict and caused our nation to be described as a failed state by all political observers and scholars need to be known so that out of the TRC process the truth can be written to guide the Liberian society for the next thousands of years. If the facts are distorted, this destruction will serve as a ground for another conflict. That is why I think it is not only a patriotic duty to appear here, it is a mandatory, mandatory duty to appear here. The law backs a compulsory process to make witnesses to appear. It is not just only voluntary on the part of those of us who have been called to testify here. Our penal law, section 12.12 .12 of the penal law, gives you authority to compel people to appear here. A failure of people that you invite to appear here is a crime under Liberian law. And I think that this commission should begin to explore that. You are on a duty to use the law as provided by the legislature. The law is clear and so maybe there are those who don't want to want to appear here. I just like to, to read it for the benefit of the public to the extent that this hearing is like. 12.12 .12 of the penal laws states is on refusal to testify before or hindering certain official bodies. A person has committed a first degree misdemeanor if without lawful privilege or excuse in the course of an official proceeding before the legislature and administrative body of the government or any lawfully constituted body of the government as the TRC is, he a refuses after lawful process to appear or to produce the material required of him or be sworn or make equivalent affirmation as a witness or answer a pertinent question and continues in such refusal after the person presiding there are directs him to answer and advises him that a continued refusal may subject him to criminal prosecution or be purposely hinders such official proceeding by noise or violent or tumultuous behavior. So, commissioners, there is a law to, to support your actions. So, as a lawyer, I don't see my appearance here as a volunteer because the law requires that I appear here once called by a lawfully constituted body to appear and perform this national duty. Now, I will testify, I have a, a long writing here, but I, I, I beg your pardon not to read, but to narrate the story consistent with what is, is written. I will testify here as an observer, a participant, and a victim, and then give some perspectives on what I see as the national problem and, some, and give some so, suggested solutions. All of us in this country, in one way or the other, are responsible for what happened to our country. As Professor Sawyer once said, you see, if you shouted too loudly, maybe that caused, that contributed to the problem. If you kept too quiet, that probably contributed to the problem. If you spoke in such low tone that no one could hear you, and some terrible things were happening around you that probably contributed to the problem. So in one way or the other, all of us are participants in varying degrees. 
I'm on the side of those people who shout and maybe shout too loudly. And I will speak about my role uh, from the 1970s to 2002. My role started as a student. Even though the scope of this hearing is 1979 to 2003, I don't think it hurts if the time is consistent with the events to, to go a little bit backwards. I joined Moja in 1976 as a, as a student in San Nicole. And I was recruited by one of my colleagues. And then Tipota came to San Nicole, Dr. Tipota and spoke to us about librarian issues, and many of us were more were motivated uh, about change from what he said. The issue was that our society was closed and needed to open, to open up politically. There was exclusion from political affairs based upon status of birth. And as a young librarian growing up, I couldn't understand that. He led on a soft bed because prior to 1976, I had been a member of the Young Christian Students, Students Movement, which was a Catholic lay apostolic organization that had had its motto, see George and act, uh, promoting and creating awareness within the student milieu. And that sort of stimulated my, my desire to, to be concerned about what happened around me. So when I entered the University of Liberia, I easily joined the Student Unification Party, which I can say even to this day, at that time was the most potent political force in Liberia, and I think today, to this day, it is still, it's still the most organized political organization in this country. It was full of men of courage, its principles stimulated patriotism and consciousness and so I joined the Student Unification Party. By 1978 I had been groomed sufficiently that I became co-chairman of, of the intellectual discourse under uh, James Logan as chairman. Logan today is the mini Deputy Minister of Agriculture and I remember some of the people who invited them were um, a lot of notable people in society today. Some of them, the former Vice President of Liberia, Benny Warner, and many persons. The intellectual discourse was a very good avenue for uh, creating awareness amongst the students of the university on what was happening in this country. But I was also a member of the editorial staff of the university spokesman, which at that time was the most fearless news organ in the country. We received information very easily from people who were in various areas in government. They provided us information that could not be published by newspapers that were on the national scene. In fact, the only newspaper that was around was owned by the truly part of the librarian age. Uh, and so we had the Universal Library spokesman and our the the motto of the spokesman was even if bullet to our breast, we shall speak the truth. And frankly at that time as a student, what I remember is that all of us who were members of the editorial staff or spokesman were prepared to die for the truth. And so in 1978, a young man, Edward Berry, uh, was, was allegedly strangulated to death by his Lebanese employers. And so we had mass rallies on the university campus to, to raise awareness about the fact that those who strangulated our colleague student to death should be brought to justice. Edward Berry was a student and then working in his store. Well, the university spokesman had an anonymous caller 
And the, in fact, two anonymous columns. One was people want to know, and the other one was Kira Zuba. So Kira Zuba wrote to George Emma Walser. George Emma Walser was considered a progressive George because a few years later he, she had demonstrated with the students of the university when they um, organized, when they had a revelation and they were taken to court. And she had associated with other public actions of, other progressive actions of young people. And not being lawyers and not knowing all of the legal processes as I know now, we didn't know that you have to have a grand jury hearing to have an indictment, and then the mother has to go to court, and then you have to get petty jury, and, and then there has to be the next term of court. So this case was dragging. And Kira Zubar wrote, it looks like George Emma Wasser has been grabbed by the two party political barbed wire. So, a lot of older lawyers were telling him, good, you always consider the students to be your friends, look what they're reading about you. And she cited us for contempt. We went to the University of Liberia Lawyer. The University of Liberia Lawyer was the late Tor Bernard. Given the honor university charter, the dean of the law school is the, is the legal counsel of the University of Liberia. When we approached Torsi Bernard, he told us, Ladies and gentlemen, we have one lady on the editorial staff, Julie Kamaya, I think she's in the States now. The court is arranged like this. The judge sits way up, the lawyer sits next, and then the ordinary person sits way below. And you, if you go to criminal court A, you will see that. That's what he told us. So what you do, we appear in court, and I will apologize on your behalf, and then you the judge will try to confirm it from you people and you apologize. We said no. Apology will mean admission. We took the summons literally. That the judge did not say we should apologize. She said, show cause why you cannot be, you should not be held in contempt. So we need to show cause. So we then when we we're headed the editorial, the head of the editorial team, the edit, chief uh, editor in chief was Jim Jimmy Fomoya, who is today Chairman of the National Elections Commission. The, the deputy to him was Walter Wisner, who is the Deputy Minister of Internal Affairs. And then there was Abitur, the columnist, who is in the United States. So we then went and sat in the corner and spent the night writing our response. We wrote a three-page response explaining why we wonder whether she had been grabbed by the true party political barbed wire. Councillor Tor Bernard pleaded with us that we were taking the wrong route and we said no, we are prepared to go to jail. We are speaking the truth and we don't care about the consequences. So we, um, we appear in court the next day and this court was jam-packed with students. University of Liberia students were upstairs and downstairs and place was so packed. Some of the lawyers that I remember in the court that day were uh, Councillor Chesson, Councillor Finley, and I don't remember some of the other lawyers who were there. Many of the lawyers thought that our day had come to go to jail because we had said too many things about the politicians and now we were saying things about the court. So he said, well, I will tell the court when the case is called that you will speak for yourselves. We say, yes, we agree. So we asked Abito, who was very eloquent and had a very heavy tone base, to read our three page reasons why we should not be held in contempt. When the case was called, he announced representation for the respondents and said the respondents would speak for themselves. Are we told stood up, read it in such authoritative tone, and before he ended, we saw George Emma was smiling a little bit. Then when we got through, he said, "She said, you know, 
a lot of people call me and say, you see, you always consider the students to be your friends, look what they are writing about you. Now you're making them to drag the coat in the mud, in the gutters. And I had not read what you wrote. Later on, I read it. I didn't see anything wrong with it, but I wanted to know your motive. What we are reading was, we always consider you to be a progressive judge. You have stood by the side of the downtrodden people, you stood for justice. And the fact that this case that involved the death of a young man who was looking for a deliberate and a student is being delayed, God was wondering whether or not you were being influenced. She said to us that she was satisfied with our explanation and that we were purged of contempt. You can imagine the outburst of jubilation in the courtroom that day with the students uh, leading us back to the university campus. Whether that sort of promoted impunity in terms of respect for the court and whether that motivated some people also to engage in actions that led to the crisis is the reason that I've mentioned it. Because what we are doing here is putting all of the information together and perhaps the writers would then link the different pieces that contribute to the crisis. In 1979, after Superfella was groomed, the sub leadership headed by Honorable Justice Wolo Kali, well, Mr. Justice Wolo Kali now, Honorable Justice Wolo Kali, appointed me chairman of the National Affairs Committee. The chairman of the National Affairs Committee of ALSU, or the National Affairs Committee of ALSU, is the one that is with national affairs outside the university campus. My co-chair was James Kaba. James Kaba today is chief clerk of the House of Representatives. And in April, again April, remember April 3rd, uh, oh, well, let me go back a little bit to 1978. Another thing happened in 1978. In 1978, President Jimmy Carter was scheduled to visit Liberia. And the student leadership of the University of Liberia wrote opposing the visit. Why did we oppose the visit? President Jimmy Carter had come and stayed in a, was scheduled to stay in Nigeria for three days. All we are read as students from elementary school to university was that Liberia had a special relationship with the United States of America. This president was spending three days in Nigeria, and then we only spent we only spent an hour at the airport, Rabos International Airport, to refuel his plane. And the government of the day, President Tupper, decided to declare the day a holiday. Part of the thing we wrote in our statement was that nations treat each other on the basis of reciprocity. If this president was only stopping at the airport, why should we declare a holiday in Monrovia? And when our president, there was no history to show that when our president traveled to Washington, D.C., there was holiday declared in any part of Washington, D.C. to even talk about the whole city. And we said that he did not consider the visit to Liberia important as the government considered it, because he had spent three days in Nigeria and was only going to spend an hour at the airport. So as citizens of Liberia and as students, we express our opposition consistent with the Constitution that even then, the 1847 Constitution protected freedom of expression that we said were opposed to the visit. So we wrote our protest statement and we published it in huge numbers. And we wanted the Americans to know that we protested. So we organized a strategy where one person would be in front of the city hall, one, well, one group would be in front of the city hall distributing the leaflets, one group would be in front of the, the uh, University of Liberia and another at the executive mansion. As I always do, I took the uh, position that I would be first, I would be at city hall. I was young, I was 
less than 25, I was, I think, 21 or 22. And uh, I was 21. And my two bodyguards, we arranged that two persons would be these guys in a group to watch whoever is distributing a leaflet so that when that person is arrested, the two can be put back to command post, as we were calling them, to the base. My two bodyguards were Ben Duny, who is now head of EPA, and then, and also again, Jim Logan, who is Deputy Minister of Agriculture. He escorted me as I moved in a crowd distributing leaflets. I said, oh, after about 30 minutes of distributing leaflets to students and to these dark shades, uh, secret service officers who were passing around with their dogs and all of that, the police officer walked to me and said, can I have it? I said, no. And anyway, finally I gave him one copy and when he read it, oh, he got enraged. And said, and, I, and then he asked for the whole batch, so I just turned around and threw it to the students from here who, who were standing near me. And then he said, you're under arrest. I was arrested, taken to the police station, and uh, I was taken before one Ernest Zuba in the CID, Lieutenant Ernest Zuba, I still remember. Ernest Zuba would then work with me several years later in my normal life. And as Uba asked me why we did it, I said, as citizens of Liberia, we had right to do what we did and explain all of the reasons that the Americans had never honored our presence that way. They never declared holiday and there was no reason for us to do it. And were, some of us were doing economics and were saying that our GDP would drop by several million dollars on this day just by, you know, and for no reason. I believe because of our protest, and maybe not, but President Carter ended up coming to Monrovia because I think it would have been shameful given all that we are saying in our protest for President Carter to remain at the airport and leave. But he came to town briefly. So I was arrested, I was questioned, and outside was Mr. Comey, we said, speaking to a crowd, explaining. So Ernest Zuba sent for him, say, you bring that man. When they went to him, he said, arrest me now. He said, no, you are now under arrest. We just want you to identify a young man in there. He looked like someone at Grenada Ball, because a small boy, he said he's a university student. Then, in the 70s, the average age of students was maybe 25, 26. There were older people going to university. And I was dressed in a, in a way that, you know, not coat suit or anything, but I was wearing some, some uh, country cloth shirt and uh, an African slipper. So Comedy Wizard came in and uh, Ernest Zuba asked me the same question he asked me and Comedy Wizard was more cheeky than I was. So he said, you are, you are under arrest. And Comedy said, you guys are cowards. Because outside there, I asked you to arrest me and you said you are not arresting me. And now you probably be behind the door and you order my arrest. Eventually, six student lead leaders ended up in jail. One of the student leaders was Commissioner John H. Stewart. Uh, Dusty Willow Kali, Kabo Wisner Sano, who is now in Social Security, and Welfare Corporation, and one William Wilson, I think he's at Finance Ministry. So we were six in there. As we'll know let, later on, we're not going to stay there uh, for a long time. As long as Jimmy Carter was in town, uh, we were kept in jail. When we entered the jail, we saw a young man who was swollen up, couldn't see his eyeballs. I said, what happened to you? He said, well, you know, I was picking these bees from this uh, bee-bearing grass right by Cesar Dennis' house. Cesar Dennis was the foreign minister of Liberia then. Around 6 o'clock in the evening, and he ordered the police to arrest me and beat me up. We then collectively said, this man is entitled to proper treatment. You must take him to JFK. And the police said, I told you, you should be speaking for yourself. And we said, we didn't come here for ourselves. We insisted on the man was taken to JFK. JFK was a very good hospital then. And then they brought us food. We didn't eat. We let the inmates eat. We said we were on hunger strike. Meanwhile, the students had gathered on the university campus and were meeting to mutiny to jump in the street and demonstrate. By, I think by 5, 4.30, 5 o'clock, we were ordered released. We got released and 
as soon as we got outside, I saw a huge group coming, singing, and be. And in front of them was Mr. Wilson Tapper, who said to us, "This is not how we wanted you out of jail. We wanted to liberate you." Uh, seeing what we've seen many years later, we can now see what sort of risk was being taken with security forces then, because. That, had a, that kind of action was not possible on a door or on a tailor. But we were released. Then, 1979 came, go back to I was chairman of the National Affairs Committee. Back on Matthews, I announced early in April, I think a week before, at the Mocha uh, Congress, that PAL, the Progressive Alliance of Liberia, was going to organize a demonstration to protest increment in the price of rice, like burns table. But they did not have the machinery to organize. Also, the Universal Library Students Union was the most powerful group in the country, especially with the backing of soup. So also under the leadership of Justin Wolokali, decided to participate in the demonstration. We printed tens of thousands of leaflets, short leaflets, calling on yellow boys, marking women, the poor, and the downtrodden to come out on April 14th to demonstrate. And we circulated the leaflets to every school in Monterey. We circulated it everywhere. We had missionaries to do it. I can still say without any fear of contradiction that I had also not participated in, in organizing the demonstration, the number of persons that came out in April 14 will not have come out. Because Bacchus Matthew was relatively new in the country. He had spent less than a year in Liberia. Uh, Paul was not fully organized on the ground yet, but Soup was organized and had very active manpower to do to carry out his work. But we were organizing the demonstration at the same time that we were organizing a revival of Linsu on Cottonton. So we left after we are organized during the week and went to Cottonton to organize, to reorganize Linsu. I didn't go as chairman of the National Affairs Committee because Linsu was represented by Comedy Wissa, who was, uh, uh, no, by, by by Justin Ulokoli. Justin was in Togo, but Siafa Kamara, his vice president, was on the ground, so Siafa Kamara was going to Kaduna and the Secretary General of, of Student Union. So, as we were at the University of Liberia in, in Soup, we were in also in many other organizations. I was pre national president of YCS, the Young Students. Move, uh, students movement that was in all Catholic schools and I was the national president that year. Commissioner Dede Dolope was one of the members of YCS at that time from St. Teresa's Convent. And so I want to represent YCS at the revival of Linsu. But So we started on Friday. On Saturday we said to our, on Friday evening we said to ourselves it would be unfair that we organize a demonstration and then bring ourselves to Cotton and sit here and not be in Monrovia and not, you know, and so to face whatever will be faced by the demonstrators. I think it will be a betrayal of the people to send them the government's way. So the chairman of the conference commonly asked for volunteers to come and I volunteer. Logan volunteer, Jim Logan volunteer, Swansea Elliott, the late volunteer. P. Bloss Sire, who is now Director General of the National Archives, volunteer and was the only woman on the trip. We chartered a taxi and came to Monrovia. We arrived in Monrovia by 10 o'clock that morning. Then the road was good. The road had just been paved and was two hours from Bangladesh to Monrovia. We got a bar pass. We decided to head towards uh, Pal headquarters that was on Gurley Street. So we took bus and community, and, but we couldn't pass Booster Quarters. The taxi driver said he couldn't go because 
uh, demonstrators were all over, and there were police and army and soldiers all in the streets. We got down and decided that we were going to pair in pairs. My, my partner was P. Blood Sire. We arrived and joined the demonstration right at police quarters, and we saw an ugly scene. The soldiers were engaging the police because the police officers there were shooting at the demonstrators. Until today, until I listened to Mr. Swan, I did not know that some of the demonstrators were also engaging the police, and that is why those of us who were demonstrating just for the cause were also uh, getting this reprisal from the police. So that's a very important revelation that was made. Uh, because until, until today, our conclusion has been for no cause the police shot, shot at armless demonstrators. And so we saw the police and the soldiers shooting at each other, and then we dispersed, and then my partner and myself went our separate ways. The next group I joined, I saw myself on, on Carey Street and joined the next demo, a group of demonstrators. You had to be in a group because you were easy, you were easy target if you were not in a group. People were being shot, their bodies were walking on their bodies and just moving on. And so we demonstrated until the end of the day. At the end of the day, I, I, I went on Ashman Street, heading towards Moja office. I got there, uh, that area was flooded with security people, so I went to my Mary Burnett's house where Dr. Fambola was staying in an apartment. There I met in the evening Dr. Sawyer, I think uh, Jim Fumoya, uh, Dr. Fambola himself was there, Loyala Fleming, who used to be head of the Social Security Welfare Corporation. He was doing political science and was a student of both Dr. Fumble and Dr. Sawyer. We stayed there overnight, uh, I guess fooling ourselves, saying that we were watching ourselves and protecting ourselves from the security forces. Uh, one person will go, or two or three persons will go out in front of the building where you now have the Oba Children's School and sit there to see whether well the security people are coming to arrest us. And after one or two hours, that group would be, uh, would change shift and another group will come. So we did that until in the morning and felt that we had protected ourselves. I think just by chance we survived because we could have been arrested that night. And Chopper knew where we were because when he spoke finally to the Liberian people the next day, he said, I knew where they were. Some of them were up Ashmore Street and hiding. We knew exactly where they were. So it means that Chopper knew where we were. After the demonstration, Tobo spoke to the nation in a very passionate tone, virtually crying, and said, what have I done? Monrovia was terrible the next morning. Uh, uh, there were debris all over the place. We ourselves, demonstrators, many of us from the university were surprised at the, the, the way the demonstra demonstration went because we then saw soldiers shooting the doors of stores and opening and looting and then letting other people go in to loot. So the demonstration turned from being a political march to express, uh, to seek redress from the government, I stayed there in the constitution and turned to a looting spree. It was terrible. So then Thomas spoke the next day and then said that he only ordered the soldiers to shoot at the lower extremities. He repeated that in the, I think, Africa or Africa Now magazine later on. And I think it was a mistake to order people to shoot at the police officer to shoot at the lower extremities. The estimate that time from journalists, non government journalists, was that there were over 200 persons killed. But I think government admitted to 40 persons being killed. These persons were buried in Miles' grave right behind the, uh, the public works at the Palm Grove Cemetery. That was the first time in the history of our country, at least that I know of, both oral and recorded history, that I've heard people being buried in Miles' grave. Terrible lesson for the country. I went into hiding in Firestone with Jim Logan again, uh, 
Gulu John Jensen, he's in the United States now, and one James Yasia were there for by that time Justin Wolo Kali, uh Stewart, Commonly we said formula a lot of people associated with the demonstration were already in jail. Some are post talking, some are central prison. Were in hiding. And one day there was a party being held somewhere. I don't drink. And uh, I used to drink more time. My friends in Firestone were were not happy with me. But Logan and others were at a party and NSA people came and picked them up. So he and James Yasia were picked up and brought to Bonaria. When I heard that, I went into further hiding and I would not go to any public place. I would go nowhere. I was hiding in the PPD camp and remained there until Tobo announced a general amnesty and everyone was released. So that was it about April 14. I think the thing that operated in favor of the of those who were detained was that OU was coming to Liberia and it would have been terrible to have student leaders in jail while Togo preside over the OAU. And I think that it is that pressure that caused the the demonstrators, the, the leaders who have been jailed from power and from the student leadership to be released. Then 1980 came. Early March 1980, Bacchus Matthews Paul had organized something called a midnight demonstration. I think you've heard about it here. We didn't know about it. Bacchus had called for the resignation of President Talbot and, and President Warner. Talbot was, I think, on a patrol, nationwide patrol, and he was in Nimba. I was as Senior student at the University of Liberia, so I remember fairly well. And uh, Tobo, while Tobo was there, they had organized a midnight demonstration. And I think E. Regional Townsend was uh, presiding over the cabinet. And that was really, really, uh, as Moja described it later on, an NBC action. That was just unacceptable. That was when uh, Idi Amin had been in power in, in Uganda and we had known what Idi Amin had done. What it did could not have been accommodated by Idi Amin. It was reported by government that it moved on the mansion with, uh, with petrol bombs, gasoline in bottles and all of that and hand grenades. That was an assault on the executive mansion. So they were arrested and detained. We did not support that. We condemned that action. Moja condemned that action. We, at, at the student leadership of the University of Liberia ourselves, did not support that action. The movie on the mansion in the night was a military action. It was not a political action. And so, when the president came back, it was reported that this had happened. And Bacchus and others were detained, and a lot of power supporters throughout the country were detained, even from Nimba, Chief Wole Tupa, uh, the late Samir Duki, and, and, and a lot of them were detained. I have been elected president of the Nimba Students Association at the University of Liberia. And then, and, and, and uh, George K. was elected president also, unopposed. On April, well, by April 10th, Mr. Swen said today by April 8th, there was wild rumor in Liberia that there were more than 50 persons in jail, that all of these people will be executed on the anniversary of April 14th. That the Tory Party leadership has signed a resolution, and that once Tobo left and went to Zimbabwe for the Lona Line conference, the execution would take place in his park. And that a resolution was in a mansion that members of the, the House of Representatives and Senate and the judiciary, everybody has signed. So when Tobo said, after Bacchus and others were arrested, 
that there will be justice in this case and justice will be done mercilessly people connected that mercilessly with the rumor that all of these people will be executed without trial and the rumor went wild in Monrovia everyone believed the rumor so April 12 came and Tobo was overthrown from April 12 till today's day nobody has seen that paper that is how dangerous rumor has been in Liberian politics rumor also contributed to our conflict because there has been no one to prove that indeed there was this decision made by the Tory party to execute all the people that were in detention but the majority of the people believed it and the soldiers believed it I believe that it was for the purpose of rescuing some of the people that were in jail that the coup took place no the leaders that were in jail Samuel Doki DK Wansalier from Nimba County, young political activist, very popular. Oscar Quia from Sino. George Bole, the only PhD at the time from Grand Jeddah, and the enlightened son that they were proud of. Who were the cool leaders? Samuel Doe from Grand Jeddah, Wesian, a sapo man like Oscar Quia from Sino. Kuopa, a Nimba man, link him with DK Wonselier and Samuel Tuki. Sorry, and Samuel Tuki. These gentlemen had to rescue. I believe it was in Zretro, or on one occasion I remember, that those said that to say that our only PhD was going to be executed, we had to rescue him. And so, but this rescue mission was based on popular yet unfounded rumor. To, to today, people search the mansion after the coup, they search the Capitol building, they search everywhere, and there is no evidence that that decision was made to execute this gentleman. So it's important if there's a lesson to learn out of the crisis to discourage rumors and to make sure that people speak the truth. Open up the space so that people don't have to hide to say this is the truth, so that every information can be verified. Lack of freedom of expression, and therefore allowing people to engage in rumors, contributed to the conflict. So I strongly believe that one of the backgrounds of the coup was that terrible rumor that the people in jail would have been executed. On April 12. On April 11, one of those executed, James T. Phillips, before his execution, was our installing officer on the University of Liberia campus. He even promised us $5,000. And George Kier was the student leader. He was installed that night. We were at the student center dancing. I went to bed early. At 11:30, a man called Bracewell came running to the student center, I mean to the Simon Greenleaf Hall, I was in the dormitory and said that all of us were in jail, we've been released, there's a coup. We said that's not true. We got outside and there was shooting in the air, but there was no exchange of fire. So Abito said to George Kier, this cannot be a coup, because this is a government that's being a power, a regime that's being entrenched, so how can they be shooting in the air and there's no exchange of fire? So maybe they are just shooting up warning shots. A young man called Rita's Union you know, and myself were brave. We sort of went to the university gate, crawled behind the buses that used to take students to Fendel and to hear what was happening. Uh, we saw two soldiers passing and two of them were speaking manner with uh, communication gadgets in the back and they said tomorrow Liberian people will see his body. We're killing him. So I brought back the news to, I said, Richard said, let's leave. Tobo has been killed and there was no resistance. I came back and told the students at the Simon Greenleaf Hall that a coup had taken place 
Mind you, that kind of thing had never happened. Our parents' parents didn't tell us that something like that has happened. It was, it was unbelievable. So that's how we knew that the coup had taken place. Next morning, people were jubilating. And I told KBK, he reminded me about this many years later. I said, I'm not happy about the coup. He said, why? I said, we will be the first target of the military. Because we are accustomed to speaking the truth. We will be the first target. This thing we have that even if bullet to our breast, we shall speak the truth, will be tested by these people. So that morning, another friend, of, another student, Emmanuel and Sigrid, and I left and headed towards Moja office to find out whether to put a new about the coup. We arrived there, there was some elderly crew people around him. He was dressed in jeans uh, and uh, navy blue shirt, the workers suit with Uncle Boot. And, and we said, do you know about the coup? He said, no. I'm just sitting here to see whether anybody will call me. We then left and went to Bishop Francis. We saw Isaac Bantu at Bishop Francis' place, and we asked him about the coup. He said, can you imagine the Americans called me this morning and asked me whether I know about the coup? They will have CIA and all that. What? I appreciate what I will know about the coup. So he was in his office. People that were at his house, people were in the street, tribulating, native women born soldiers, soldier killed Tobo, and all of that. And then EFBC were playing Papa's Land the whole day, and fire in Sueto. The day went. But true to what I said, we became the first target. Harry Zuo, a member of the PRC, brought information to the students, to, 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 to spokesman editorial staff, when George K. was also president. To the effect that George Bolle, that Rasami brothers had given $500 to some members of the PRC through the president, Minister of State for Presidential Affairs, and spokesman published a story of Britain. Harry Zou came and said, you wrote about Tobo government and will overthrew Tobo. It will be unfair not to write about us too. Here is what is happening even under our regime. As Ben Jira, who was editor-in-chief of the spokesman, said to me later on, Ben Jira said that do call him and call uh, he and George Kier and I went to the marshal and he came back, that's what he said, and that was the end of the spokesman actually. He said, Do told them, so you university students think that the PRC cannot execute students. If you guys play with me, I will execute you 12 o'clock in the day. And he came back afraid. I don't remember spokesman publishing much after that. I said, well, I said it, that we were going to be the first victim. Because as a student leader, I went to Tobot's office at least twice. And every time he will ask us to engage and debate national issues, and we always left impressed with him. As much as we were critical of him, we were not prepared for military rule. And so, from 1980, student leadership, effective student leadership on University of Liberia just subsided. Then, come 19, well, let me say a little bit about before going to 1983. In 1980, Kuo Kwa, who used to be called Strongman, uh, went to Firestone for medical treatment. When he came from there, it was my understanding that members of the PRC were trying to hold door to collective action and trying to discourage corruption and trying to make sure that they act properly. And Kuopwa said the PRC was people one voice through the chairman, and he was back to instill discipline. That was in 1981. 81. So in 1983, when we were told publicly that Do had appointed Kuopwa Secretary General of the PR Secretary of the to the PRC, and he had refused. I thought he had gone back on his own words. He had said that the PRC should speak with one voice and that he was there to instill discipline and should speak to the chairman. For disobedience, 1981, uh, 
other members of the PRC, five members, who at the time, the prevailing view was that these were the five that were disagreeing with Doe on the PRC. These five headed by Wesian, Henry Zou, the guy who had brought information to us, Joseph Sumo, two of them from Grand Judah, Harry Johnson and Nelson Toe, were executed for uh, reportedly planning to overthrow the government. You know what? The coup was announced. The information that they wanted to overthrow the, the government was announced nine o'clock in the night. But at about four o'clock today, some members of the PRC wanted to overthrow the PRC. At that time, it was reported that Wesleyan had even gone to escorted IE to to Buchanan. And these people were not together. One of the fellows from Grand Jeter, Alan Nelson to or, 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 or Harry Johnson was in Grand Jeter. Anyway, there was a quick trial by the military tribunal and these people were executed. This brings me to explaining, I mean, to, to the position I always take on librarian issues, that we must de tribalize and de exercise the librarian issues, otherwise we will not understand it. The issue is those in power all the time who want to exclusively keep power for themselves will deal drastically with those who question the authority to hold power exclusively. If that were not true, why would they execute Harry Johnson and Nelson Toe, two members of the PRC who were crown speaking like him? How do you explain if you put our politics, our crisis in ethnic context? How do you ex explain that? It's the same thing that I say to people when you say all oh, the American, American librarians are bad and they, are, they, were the, they were the source of the problem that was wrong with, with this country collectively and not just suffering the issues and deal with the actors. You are wrong because where do you put our board? A pure, a pure bred American librarian mother and father who stood up against autocratic rule from the 1920s to 1986 when he died. Where do you place him? Where do you place him? If you exercise that brain politics and put it into that dichotomy of one ethnic group against the other, you don't explain librarian politics properly. So why would Toba kill Koma and his son? They were pure bred American librarians from Clear Island. And so why? You can even explain tell us exclusion of how power American librarian uh, uh, were descendants of how power Ameri American librarian leadership from his own government. Why? I explain that like many of the majority of the people in this country, Taylor himself came from a poor background. Came from a poor settlement. No history of wealth. Didn't go to elementary school in England. He went to KRTT. He suffered like us, but took it a different way. And that's why he shared his experiences. He felt a, some sort of common background with a majority of the people. That is my understanding of uh, the situation, observing it as an observer participant. I don't think we can analyze our issue in ethnic context. So, in 1983, Kuopa, after refusal, was connected to something called a Nimba raid, which I felt was unfortunate. It was a very silly action taken by a majority of Nimba people, in a, some people in the, in the military, all of the, most of the participants were from Nimba, even the civilian participants who were linked. You know, like the DK wants, late DK wants Ali and Doki and all of these people were from Nimba. I don't understand the political motive. Why attack in Nimba? Was it to take Nimba and then declare it independent as a Nimba Republic or what? I just couldn't understand. And like I say, I was president of the Nimba Student Association, but I just felt strongly against military rule and did not make friends with any of them, did not associate with them. Uh, at all. It is my understanding that some Nimba people may have told 
qualify now to take the position as secretary. Uh, what the rumors I heard that time was that in fact Do and Kuomba had talked and Kuomba had accepted the position before Do wrote the letter and then so what he said later on said he was not accepting the position that was dishonoring his military duty to a superior officer that was also a betrayal after meeting with a friend and then that led to other people going to exile and Kuomba himself because of this decision not being part of PRC and not obeying the chairman's decision and going against his own statement that the PRC should speak with one voice to the chairman and that he was there to state discipline, everybody should be the chairman himself, having gone against the chairman, was guilty of a, a mutiny in a way. So this is what led him to exile. People were arrested, tried. Uh, people were arrested, they remained in jail, and then do declare amnesty. And then 1985 elections came. After the elections, or well, before the elections, before 1985 elections, let me go back a little bit. In 1984, I was uh, a, f a founding member of the Liberian People's Party along with James Fomoyan, Dr. Sawyer as organizing chairman, the Lee Wood Tapia, uh, Mr. Anthony Kessley, Dusty Wilokali, a whole bunch of them, uh, former Moja uh, members and former Sioux members. We formed LPP and then Do said that all who wanted to contest political position in the ensuing election should resign. Dr. Sawyer, as chairman of the organizing committee, committee of LPP, gave a press conference, I think it was a Holiday Inn Hotel, and said Joe must begin with himself because he had announced that he was going to run. That was a fair statement. But Decree 88A was still in place. I believe Decree 2A had not been repealed. Decree 2A said that uh, ban all political activities including student political activities and all of that and uh, I think then student Verde will know that in 1982 some of the students some students were arrested and detained some student leaders uh, Larry Tupac and the rest of them for uh, defying that defying the PRC and going ahead with student political activities so Sawyer was arrested detained Dr. Wolokoli took over as acting chairman and Dr. Wolokoli, me and uh, uh, Anthony Kessley and Emmanuel Nsimbe wrote a strong statement of the party condemning the arrest of Dr. Sawyer and, and other political issues. Dr. Wolokoli and Anthony Kessley were charged with violation of degree 88A Order arrested. Kessley went into hiding somewhere in Lofa. Just Dr. was more pronounced. Don't knew him personally. He was a teacher. At, I think he was a teacher at Marcus Garvey School that Do was attending. A nice school. He had been an assistant minister in government, and so he was well known. Kessley was a, was only a student and obscure. So Dr. Wolokoli was arrested because he signed the release, even though we authored it. And uh, he was put in jail. Then Sawyer was in jail. The students demonstrated. On August 22nd, the Interim National Assembly, of which uh, Honorable Commissioner was a member, I believe, INA, do appear before the INA order that the students be moved and removed. Reading here, I was not a student then. I graduated in 81 and 82. I was a teaching assistant. And I was teaching on the university campus. And on August 22nd, the controller has said I will be take pay at three o'clock. So I came. I was with, I was in a research institute with Dr. Brother Baker Azango. I was a teaching assistant in the economics department. I just walked out there to meet uh, Dr. Brother Baker Azango. And past three, we heard shooting all over university campus. 
So I said, well, in Africa, people will not touch an old lady. So there are brother, Brigham and Zango, having me with gray hair and an elderly, I grab her hand and say, we'll walk out of the campus. I thought by holding her hand, nothing will happen to me. We got out right under the plum tree by the cottage. They grabbed her hand and started to beat her. Then I gave her on myself. They, they started beating her profusely. I said, stop, this is an elderly lady. And they wouldn't stop. Bunch of soldiers, they were using bitter root, and I even rotten to beat her, big stamp. So I walked, I was trying to walk out of the campus towards St. Patrick's. I got in front of the cottage, and I came across a group headed by uh, the late Colonel Afri Zed. He was a member of the PRC, and he raped me to the ground, and he stripped me, they took off my shirt, my trousers, and uh, I only had brief on. I was very, very tiny. As Dr. Sion told me a few years ago in, in America that this man is fat. I was very, very tiny. So lying under the soldiers and beating those who were hiding in the buildings said I had been killed. That is the news they carry around. Because the blood gushing off from my head. And I walked. I managed to walk and get outside the university campus. It's true that were, they were raping women because I saw a lady who was a secretary in Liberia College being raped right by the top of the monument, and just a reflex action, I yelled, stop! And on the light side, I saw a soldier running, coming after me, stop, stop, hot! With one foot of my shoes, and said I should give the other foot of my shoes, because when they had struck me earlier, they had taken one foot of my shoes, and actually he was tapping me to take one foot of my shoes, so he took the other one and left. So someone took shirts, someone took trousers, someone took my pair of shoes. I walked, I was naked going, when I got behind St. Patrick, there used to be a road, and a group of women brought their lapa and tied around me. Later on, I was taken to um, SD Copa Clinic, and I was treated, and the doctor said I could spend the night. Somehow, I just said I don't want to spend the night here. I was told that 30 minutes to an hour later, the other injured pe people who had been taken to the hospital were rounded up and taken to shuffling. I didn't see that, but I was told. Then I left. When I left, I went up country. And then um, when uh, we resumed school, after school we reopened, I was told to check the president's office. I went to the president's office. The PRC had removed the entire university leadership. And I must say that I strongly believe that it was the decision of the PRC following the August 22nd incident that got the university the way it is today because I think it was a coup against scholarship and intellectualism. Not only there was the university president and vice president, presidents removed, the deans of colleges and heads of academic programs were all removed and replaced by people who are now going through the uh, rigor of, of climbing the academic ladder. So, Dr. Joseph Morris, who was, I think, Deputy Minister of Education, was appointed president of the university, and the students opposed it. I went to his office, and he handed me a letter of dismissal. And I said, why? I'm not even a full staff of the university. I'm just a teaching assistant. I'm not even an instructor. Why dismiss me? He said, my son. He bent his head and said, my son. He bowed his head. Embarrassed and said, Look, I'm acting upon instructions of the PRC. I left. I later heard that James Fomoyan, also a teaching assistant in political science department, was dismissed. We were the only two teaching assistants dismissed. And I think I can only link it to the fact that we were, also, we were members of the organizing committee of LPP, whose leadership, whose leader had been arrested, that led to the crisis. Then that was 1984. 1985 came, elections took place. People strongly believe that Jackson, the, the, uh, the lab won, Jacksonville won. Uh, and the reason is this. During the election period, uh, I remember lab had trained pool watchers and they were trained by Dr. Wolokali. They were deployed over the country and the results were actually counted at the polling stations and they all called back, came back with the tabulations. 
And so the parties knew that they had won. And the party knew they had won. But then, those set up a 50 mayor commission to count the ballots. And I think if you have time, honorable commissioners, you need to call one or two members of that special commission that was set up to count the ballots. I remember that Emmanuel Shaw was a member. I remember the lady called Zoe Zilli. They were, they were 50, and some are in Liberia here. Let them, let them tell us what they tabulated. While they were, the 50 million committee was counting, Mr. Prince Johnson was lieutenant in the AFL, and here I was living behind the city hall, and he used to tell me every day that his old man Jackson do I won. I said, look, this is politics. Don't be too sure. And so when on November 12th, he told him, oh, my chief, Mark Sharp, Colonel Sharp told me that they, oh, they have burned so many ballots, but the old man still won. I said, don't be sure. I, have, I don't have that kind of expectation. So when they announced the result, he was, he was totally confused. So when on April 12th that morning, I was in law school, when Cooper and others hit town, that evening watching TV, I saw Prince Johnson on the television at LBS, you know, next to Kumapa talking, going up and down and talking. I said, well, I expected this man to be a part of this. It was after that that we didn't see Prince Johnson anymore behind the city hall. He went into exile. So that was what I know about 1985. Of course, everyone knows. You've heard the stories of how people were killed. Then 1990 came. 1990, I was a lawyer now, and I was practicing with Galawolo. I had a case in Kakata. In December, December 26 or so, I was going to Kakata, and there were people in a taxi talking about these Nimba people in a taxi. I said, oh, you know, do just want to kill our people again. It's not true. It's not possible that after 1985, that people will be brave enough to do something like this and to pass through Nimba of all places. I knew I was taking risk by talking to people I didn't know. They could have been security people. On 27th December, I heard tell on BBC. That's when I got scared. And I was thinking, I wanted to know, these people would know where I work, that I work with Galawolo because I had said, you know, this was untrue. Don't say he was, tell us he was coming to get rid of the board door and re reinstate democracy. Being how my partner and myself were gathered at that time, I told him, Liberian people won't change, but now with Taylor, we know what he did at GSA. We want a leader who will not be corrupt. And I don't think Taylor is a replacement. Both of us agreed. At that time, Ro Tapia, the late peace be to his actions, had come from attending the French Revolution uh, anniversary as a student leader he uh, passed through United States and I received a letter from Columbia University addressed to me because someone had nominated me for a human rights fellowship since I was engaged I was a young lawyer with a group of lawyers Supu and Galo who were taking human rights cases and I said to myself I'm not going to America for five months I will stay and what happened to me you are not paying besides it will be an additional experience, so why don't you take it as I'm not? And then, the only reason I went is when I heard Taylor on, November, on December 27, I said, no, I have to leave. Because I have passed uh, 1983, 1985, as a man coming from Nimba, nothing happened to me, I was not prepared to take this additional risk. And so I went to call Columbia University Collect, and my ticket came and the visa came. I arrived in America on the 12th of January 1990. When the program was over in, in April, I mean in February, uh, May, five months later, everybody left. There were people in the program from Egypt, from Namibia, from Latin America, and uh, Asia. And so I couldn't leave America because I couldn't come back to Liberia with war. And I was just kept, I was a birdie on the center, 
they were paying my rent and taking care of me and I was trying to run their newsletter, just doing whatever they wanted me to do. Then in September I got a call from Dr. Wolokali who said that Dr. Sawyer had been elected interim president and he wanted me to come back to Liberia, come to Sierra and join him since I had just left Liberia. Dr. Baranta also came from Banju and called me. And so I had a return ticket to Liberia because my ticket uh, at Colombia was for one year. So I went back, I went um, to Air Africa and booked, came to Sierra Leone with Dr. Wolokali on the 20th on the 18th of September, I arrived on the 19th, and there met uh, Commissioner Stewart and Mr. Wulukali, I mean, Mr. Fumoyan. The next day, on the 20th, we went to Bitumani Hotel to meet Dr. Sawyer and the interim leadership. He asked for volunteers to come to Liberia to see what the situation was so that the interim government can relocate to Liberia. I volunteered. Frankly, if I knew what was ahead of me, I would not have volunteered so that it doesn't appear that I was brave. I didn't know what was happening ahead of me. We came on MV uh, uh, River Ambi, a Nigerian a naval vessel that was bringing the 72nd Airborne Battalion Nigerian Army that was coming to join Ecomog. We spent even though German is shipped on the 21st, we arrive on the 24th because we had to spend two days evading attack from Taylor because some BBC reporter in Sierra Leone announced that the ship was leaving Sierra Leone to Liberia. We arrive on the 24th and the free port was smelling terribly and I asked one student what happened and said well, about 300 persons were killed here a few days ago who were, something exploded and so many people died here and they just, you know, they got right in smell all over the place. There were dead bodies lying all over. Uh, they launched us at Hotel Africa and on our way to Hotel Africa there were dead bodies lying all over. People were walking single on one side of the road, single file. And we got to Hotel Africa. The next day we were taking to see General Prince Johnson. He gave us one looted car um, a um, uh, Mercedes, I mean, a full second bus. And uh, we placed on it because ECOMO had been told by Dr. Sawyer to introduce us to all of the forces on the ground. At that time, they did not have contact with AFL, so they introduced us to INPFL. We then put an ECOMO emblem on our vehicle to show our neutrality. That anger, Prince Johnson. We had ECOMO bodyguards. A few days later, uh, we are heard, in fact, on the day we arrived, one Michael Doe, uh, I think the guy named Fumo Miller or so, but he was the chief accountant. They had been killed on that day, reportedly by Prince Johnson, and buried right by the swimming pool at Hotel Africa. The place was quiet. Uh, a lot of people were in sad mood. A day later, we heard that old Prince Johnson had said that Annie Broderick, the former beauty Queen, who was working, I think, as personal director or so at Hotel Africa, had reported to Prince Johnson that um, the two men had money kept that Gorse Covehagen, the head of the hotel, left behind, and people were hungry and they were not sharing the money with them. Prince confirmed this later on in a meeting and said, Oh, it's Annie Broderick who told him. Annie Broderick then, a few days later, had told. Um, Dr. Leva Zanga, who was head of the team, the five of us came to Liberia. Was Leva Zanga chair? I was co-chair. Jim Fomoya was on the team. Jamuna Stewart and uh, Natana Bear. So he, she had told um, Leva Zanga that she wanted to leave. Zanga then told me he didn't tell me. No, she had told Zanga she wanted to go to Freeport. So Zanga asked me to escort him. We got in the bus provided by. Prince Johnson and we were coming to see Ambassador Peter divorce. We stopped her at the Freeport and we left. Later on, we heard she had escaped. She planned a perfect escape. She left all her personal belongings behind and only wore a dress and I believe a purse and got on the bus and came. So, two days later, 
there were about 50 INPFL fellows at Hotel Africa, and it was, and we later got to know that it was writing a report on us on a daily basis. We didn't know. So they had written a report that on a certain day, the interim government delegation led, gave, I mean, took Sister Annie to town, and from that time, she had not been seen. So Prince Johnson came, or came from town, America Richard Sewa told us, Prince says, General Johnson says, even if you come 12 o'clock, you should go to his base. We wouldn't go to Prince Johnson's base on Carwell at night. Next morning, we, were, we went to Ekuma base, and America Brigadier Weezy, who was chief of staff, and Pa Gay, the chief military intelligence officer, a Gambian military officer, when we explained about any brother, they started laughing at us. And we said, why are you laughing? He said, because you guys are not being Liberia. In this war, woman business is worth, worse than murder. It's, it's like treason. You don't play with any badass woman. And, you know, Prince Johnson has all the women around here. So you are in deep trouble. Anyway, we, we said, we're not going to come up to Prince Johnson's base until you take us. So they took us to Prince Johnson's base. As we will know later on, at the wrong time. They took us in the afternoon at about 4.30. We arrived at Prince Joseph Base. When we arrived to Liberia earlier in September, we went to Prince Joseph Base. At that time, Tom Oya announced that Prince Joseph had been, had been killed. So General Samuel Vani came out, and I was not Prince Joseph, so we thought he was pretending to be Prince Joseph. And then later he came out, and he came and embraced me. So when we were in trouble, everybody looked to me to answer because this man had hugged me. So then, Prince Johnson came and said, where is Annie Broderick? I tried to explain. He put me in jail. Um, and then I, he put me in jail around 5.30. Brigadier Weezy said he will not leave. At 11.30 in the night, he put me out. He had told Brigadier Weezy reportedly that he will release me in the morning. In the morning, I told Dr. Zanga, let's go to Prince Johnson base. He will be surprised that we'll go there without soldiers. Because that night, Ekomo has said to us, the way you guys were treated, we can give you a speedboat back to Freetown tonight. I said to myself, you know, I see, if we go back, these politicians will be afraid to come here. And Ekomo cannot be here without political authority, so we just have to bear the pain and stay. So we stayed. Next morning, Zanga reluctantly went with me to Prince Johnson's base. In fact, that morning, General Charles Bright, who was still with Prince Johnson then as a as a as an advisor, he had not gone to Taylor yet, and one talker came to see us and he took us in the car. So let's go. We got there, we got a car where base, Prince Johnson was on his way, coming to Monroe, he was in navy blue, Mercedes saying that he was coming to fight the AFL because AFL uh, he wanted to come and get rid of the remnants of those soldiers. So he, when he saw me, he got down from his car, he almost had an accident, left the car on hug me, turn me around, put me down, hug me and say, oh, my brother, oh my God, thank God I was going to kill my own brother last night. Yet he was the man who had said he would release me in the morning. He said to me that morning, he was going to kill me. And thank God that he managed to release me the night before. From then, I never went to Prince John's base again. Because that revelation, I thought that that would have happened. But knowing me, I didn't think that that would have happened, and when he said it, I got really scared. So then, we left, went back to 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 uh, to Sierra Leone, briefed the interim government, and then came back November 21, and the interim government was installed. I worked with Sawyer for four years, attended all of the peace conference, most of the peace conferences, from the Banju one in October 1990 to the Lomé. One Lome two to the Yamasukra one two four um, the Kotonu all of those conferences I was present for example in Lome when Taylor signed the Lome Peace Accord and, and later on rejected it. I was I was present I was present right there when he rejected it. Uh, I was standing right there. So I have a lot of information, maybe some of those will be written in the book is now for, for this, but it's important to know that I was there for most of that period. So then, after the interim government came down, I went to South Africa, worked for UN a little bit as member of the UN Observer Mission in South Africa, came back, 
and started active practice, uh, resumed active practice of law with B.N. Howard. And a majority of our practice was defending journalists, political activists, and um, all of these um, people who were expressing their views and were filing hippie corpus all of the time. One of the hippie corpuses that were filed was uh, in a case with Stanton Peabody and Jim Situa. They were a daily observer, a Malaysian editor, and editor in chief, respectively. And Jyoti was head of the police. And I argued the hippie corpus that day against my colleague Tisigu, who was on the other side. Uh, he was Solicitor General. And Jyoti took my argument personally, you know, because I was arguing against the police director and what he did and all of that. So then, uh, well, prior to that also, something had happened in town and, and Jyoti fell up. He said, I pointed at him. So he saw me at the, the Temple of Justice building, attacked me and, went, and started fighting me. And he was arrested by the county attorney and detained. So there was some personal anger with, with me. April 6 came under that. We have had several cases prior to April 6. On April 6, I told my wife, I'm going to hide him. I won't tell you where I'll hide because at one point you will show where I am or someone will cajole you to show where I am. I went to a friend's house that I had not visited for all the time that I had lived in Gate Town. Pure Freeman. I think a day after the the April 6 started. My brother and my sister's boyfriend who was with MPFL then came with a bunch of friends from MPFL looking for me in a vehicle provided by Taylor. They had gone to Taylor and told Taylor they wanted to save Councillor Gonglu before someone mistakenly kills him. And Taylor had agreed and generously provided a vehicle that brought them to Gate Town. They came to my wife and my wife seeing my brother-in-law and saying, well, that's his sister's boyfriend. You know, it was fair to show where. Say, but I don't know where he is. She thought I would be at my friend's place and let him, and let him there. When he came, my friend, I think it was just God. He just saw him and said, Madam, where is Councillor Gonglo? And she said, oh, I thought he was here. He said, well, you know, I think I have to put on my clothes so we'll go look for Councillor Gonglo. I, I was in the room hearing him. Some came, I think Eva Masale was with a group who was now senator, and then they drank water and all of that, they left. So when he escorted and came back, I said, where did you get that idea from to put this poor in the defense? Because had you, wait, had you waited for them to ask you, the party would not have believed you. But you saved my life by that spontaneous question. Because maybe Taylor would not have killed me, but at Taylor's house were jolted in charge, I don't know what will happen to me. But I can, but for what happened later on, I can say that maybe Taylor would not have killed me. Anyway, my wife then went to call Ambassador Irua, went to Ambassador Irua's uh, secretary, Ambassador Iroha was the Nigerian ambassador, a very good friend. And so, once she called, he said, where is he? I'm looking for him. Send a vehicle, a DC uh, Jeep, DC plated Jeep, with some Ecomore students inside, came to my wife where she was, and my wife, very thoughtful, and that was saved my life, came with that jeep straight to my friend's house. She still felt, as a wife, that I was there. She didn't press the fire with the people that were behind her, but when she came, it was Freeman who walked to her and said, yes, he's here. On the very day, and then I got in the jeep and went to safety at Nigeria's, Nigerian, Nigerian house. There, I met Comte Wisse and his family. Later on, my family joined. On one day, which I think was the day I came closest to death, uh, Ambassador Ira asked me to escort in the Ecomo base. We went to Ecomo base on our return. The, the uh, AFL had attacked uh, uh, the ERW junction. And then we were stopped by MPFL uh, fighters ready right another go. I was between. Medina Wise, Mrs. Medina Wise, Chris, uh, one of the aides of the ambassador, and the ambassador himself sat on the side. Ambassador gave me a face cap. I was sitting in the middle. But what got me really scared was on the JC and Howard side, coming from Pinsville, was standing on that side, Joe Tate, 
Jerry Joe Tate, Kuku Dennis, Chonti Richardson, uh, uh, Benny Nayure, and Charles Bright. And all of them armed. And then Joe Tate started walking towards the car. I just, I became lifeless. I couldn't say a word. And then, like in Basel, I was reading my mind. He jumped out of the car and, and ran towards Joe Tate and grabbed Joe Tate. Jotis hand and walk back to the wall where the other gentleman was was standing, and then he explained to him, "Go back. When we clear the place, we'll call you." As he was walking back, Jotis grabbed his hand and started walking. Then he walked Jotis back, and then left Jotis and ran back to the vehicle. When as soon as he got in the vehicle, the driver turned and we we, we ran back to Ekuma Base. And I said, he said to me, "I said, Ambassador, you saved my life because you know." This gentleman would have taken me from this car, killed me. Nigeria and Liberia will never break diplomatic relationship because of me. But you maybe you will issue one protest statement, but I'll be gone. He said I was reading your mind, and I did, you know. And he act, so we went. Then a few days later, we came back. We came back in a convo with Ambassador uh, Nyaki and Ambassador Bell and the rest of them were negotiating the end of the April six. Ambassador Gardner from the Pijo, the Pijo took me into a Nigeria house. He went inside with the other ambassador. As soon as, ambassador, as, soon as Mr. Taylor saw him, he said, You, Joshua, you think I don't know that you are keeping Councilor Gongolo and company, we say, in your residence? Anyway, keep on. He's denied, but he became nervous. He did like he was going to a barber and told his orderly, He said, Look, go get that man, put him in a, in a armor personnel carrier, take him to Ekamok base. So he came with the armor personnel carrier and started yelling at me to get in the armor personnel carrier. My wife was crying, my children were there. I said, why? He said, you, get in the thing. I got inside and then later on that night, I was taken to Ekuma base. That's how I survived that. He, to, till today, Ambassador Euro had not told me why he took that decision, but Madwako, who was an officer there in charge of intelligence, told me, six months later you know why you were taken out of the building in that mood I mean, so quickly and, and, and your wife was crying as a then they explained that ambassador was confused as he entered with Taylor printer you and company we said at that time company we said and his family had moved to Ekuma base and it was only i was the only one who was there with my family and david mayonga was in the was in one part of the building but people were visiting the place and uh and I don't know whether some of these people were visiting. They were also going to Taylor's yard that was next door where the Chinese embassy is and coming back. So anyway, we survived April 6. Then fast forward in 2001, we had this problem with the, with the Bar Association where our president was, was held in contempt and detained by the House of Representatives. And then I had been at the court when it was Councilor Jimmy Pierre who actually broke the news in the civil law court that day in the chambers of the civil law court. And he said, and everybody was angry, including the late George Winston Heron. And Jimmy Pierre made a proposition that he didn't know I would take. He said, you know, knowing the court, I think we just boycott the whole, court. we uh, boycott everything at the bar. I said, but that's what we'll do. So, we had an emergency bar meeting. Chairman Fredier was a member of a young, active, a very vocal member of the bar then. And at the bar meeting, I got up and made a motion for boycott and was unanimously carried. And we said boycott is freedom of action, is an action that is sanctioned by the Constitution. We have a right to work and not to go to work. So we will not go to the legislature. We're not going to call, we're not going anywhere until they release our president. Later on, I mean, then why he was there, the president of the acting president of the vice president, set up a committee with me, Benedict uh, uh, Sanna, uh, uh, Councillor William Winter, and now Councillor Clark to draft the position of the bar. We drafted it, and we, I think there was a suggestion that we all sign so that if they want to put us in jail, they put, they put all of us in jail. But the prevailing view was, oh, let the, the leaders of the bar sign. So the president of the bar and the 
vice president for Montserrado County uh, by sign. Uh, Ishmael Campbell from Montserrado and Marcus Jones, vice president of the bar. Because they signed, they were also uh, cited for contempt, legislative contempt. And then they were held in contempt. We said, but we all wrote this thing. They said, no, we are putting these two people in jail for contempt. Later on, the, purpose, the way the thing was going, I, as I understand, through Mr. Taylor, the House of Representatives dropped his case. The, uh, Mr. Masala and others dropped their, their case. So then the case ended. So I went on DC talk and said, the case is now moot. And because the case is moot, our president cannot be in jail. Because the issue out of which he was thrown in jail is now moot has been resolved. So uh, the man must be released. The next morning, Taylor also appeared on the DC talk and said yesterday, there was a lawyer who appeared on this radio on top of mootness of issue. We know them. Those are the people who come up here and fool them. They can dress in dark suit in the middle of the night. We still know them. That got a lot of my friends afraid. And uh, people were asking me to leave the country. I said, I'm not leaving. Then Marcus Jones was thrown into jail with Campbell and they were telling them once they express regret and apologize, we say, Expressing apology means taking, divesting all of the bar members of their degree because we wrote legal positions in our statement. We will not express regret. Through the intervention of some prelates and elderly women, Mary Burnell, Teresa Lee, Sherman, uh, and the rest of them, Ruth Perry, they started negotiating the end of the crisis. When it looked like they were going to end it, and some of our friends in the bar were, call, were calling us Taliban, me, Councilman Freddy, and the rest of them because they said we're Highlanders, so they were calling us Taliban. So, all the women who came to negotiate, they say, look, we have talked to the house. There is a way, but they want to meet the bar and see how we can resolve it. But you, Councilor Gonglo, please don't go. And I said, how would I go? Because I'm a member of the executive council of the bar. So, all of them say, I shouldn't go. Benedict Sano shouldn't go. Elizabeth Boyner shouldn't go. The name. All the, these Taliban who shouldn't go. Well, we didn't go. Later on, the issue was resolved in a very controversial way because there was a statement that seemed to be like regrets or whatever. And many of us were not angry with the statement. Anyway, I mean, we're not happy with the statement. One of the things that happened to our colleague, Councillor Jules, was that he stayed in jail until his 30 year old son died. Why he was in jail? I still remember that moment. Now, while the issue was not resolved, the by election was coming up, so many of us agreed, decided that we will make Councillor Jones and Councillor Campbell, President and Vice President of the Bar, to embarrass the government and say that the President and Vice President of the Bar are in jail. So I wrote a letter and I personally took it to Central Prison after visiting hours and got the two gentlemen to sign and I brought it and, gave it and sent it to Councilor Vani Shema who was chairman of the Elections Commission. So we unanimously elected the two of them and then subsequently with that and other actions, two of them were released. Our action worked. Later on, Councilor Jones told me, well, Taylor had come, come out while this crisis was on said, there is a bar in the bar that is causing all this trouble. So later on, when Councillor Jones was released from detention, he said he met with Taylor at a meeting arranged by some people, and Taylor expressed concern about me, and pointed to me as one of the bar in the bar. So he came and said, look, as you usually call younger members of the bar, small brother, he said, small brother, you know, you stood up for me and everything. We had even gone to file petition already, a hippie couples to get him out of jail, questioning the legitimacy of the detention, that one was denied. So he said, you stood up for me, you spoke and everything, but I got to tell you what I hear. Taylor is very concerned about you. You worked with Sawyer before, and he said that you are one of the bars in the bar that you were referring to. I said, well, I hear it, but I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm not going to be paranoid around. I'll go do what I do, speaking and defending the people I should defend. A few months afterwards, Asa Musa, who was military advisor, met 
my younger brother, who is in the law school now, Philip Gongli, is working my law firm. And Philip had gone to pay our telephone bill, and Isaac Musa was chairman of the special committee to collect telephone bill till I appointed him. And he said, You, what is your brother looking for in Liberia? Emma Sawyer has left. Kofi Wu has left. Community will say I left. He just named a whole lot of people. So, what is he doing in this country here? Well, tell him. If he doesn't want to leave, tell him after 7 o'clock, he will not get in the street. He didn't lose anything. He better be in the house. So, I used to go home 5 o'clock and true to Azim Musa's advice, I never used to get out at night. That is why on April 24th, when I escorted my wife to the airport, and upon my return, I was arrested broad daylight because I couldn't be arrested at night. At 3.30, I had gone to Chuba, where I live, and I was, um, I was returning right at IPA building a, 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 a police major, Dolomark, flagged me down and I stopped and he came to me and he said, Councillor, we need you at the police station. I said, what do you mean? He said, want you to come explain something to us. I said, but what? He said, when you get there, you'll know. I said, all right. I've been out of my law office the whole day. I went to the airport to carry my wife and now I just came to town. So let me reach the law office. In 30 minutes, I'll be with you. He said, no, you must go with me. I said, no, no, your language is changing. What do you mean, must? Am I under arrest? He said, no. I said, all right. I can't, I'm, I'm going to test this man. So I, I started the car to go. He said, you are under arrest. I said, all right. Can you let your Jeep drive behind us and you ride my car? My fear was that if I go in the Jeep, the Jeep would have gone into a location, another location. My car would have been parked. And since I was alone in the car, it would be like, you know, he disappeared which was not impossible at that time. So we came, I only asked him to make one call while we, before we left. I said, can I make one call to my office? Because there's a standing order at my office that the staff will wait for me until I return from wherever I go before they leave office. So I want to call them before they stay in the office at night. I said, yes, so I called. Once he agreed, I called Councilor Bian Howard and told him, please inform Aloysius to the human rights community you know, JPC, the bar, and Aloysius so informed the press. He said, you said you were calling your staff. I said, yeah, but I'm calling my partner. He jacked the phone from me, but I had made my call. So Bian Howard came to the police station later on. Aloysius too, and Dempster Brown came there. He asked me, he said, what did you say in Guinea? Can you explain what you say in Guinea? I delivered a speech in Guinea that talk about civil, at a civil, manner U.S. civil society, conference in Guinea Conakry and I actually thought I would have been arrested in Guinea because I spoke about the social political conditions preceding the 1989 uh, uh, invasion that the condi social political conditions in the three countries were similar there were denial of rights there were violation of, of there was no democracy in those three countries a high level of unemployment all of that and I thought that perhaps Contact will have said, Who is this man speaking like this in my country? Fortunately, I was not arrested there. But on the delegation was one Marie Washington, chairman of the board of the market association at the time. When I spoke, she got up and said, You know, this man said that I'm messenger for Taylor. I never said such thing. I said that, you know, market association, drama, you know, all these civil society organizations must remain neutral in all situations, all political situations, because if they remain neutral when there is crisis, they can intervene because they will be considered neutral. But they undermine their neutrality by being part of their opposition or being part of the ruling party. And I say the marketing institution has been a chairman squad in Liberia for the ruling party as they happen on a do. And the mistake I made was to be sophisticated and say, Ma uh, Madam Mary, uh, and this is no offense to Madam Mary Washington. And she took it at pointing her out in the place. So she came to Liberia and went on case radio and TV and said that her gone and said, Baba takes a bottle. 
in Guinea. I tried to go on the same case television and radio to explain. She came back in the station disturbed. Anyway, I believe Taylor believed her more than me. So subsequently, I was arrested on the 24th of April uh, and detained. A lot of the police officers, I must say, I remember a lot of police officers hissing their teeth and say, this thing is going too far. Why are you arresting Councilor Gonglo for? And Jolo Mark said, those police officers who didn't want their job and who didn't want trouble better keep quiet. He took me to the charge of quarters and the CIA, the person in charge of detaining people said he would not detain me. And Dolo Mark said to him, this decision is coming from top top, so if you know what you know, you better put this man in jail. Alosha told Kim, let her give me $10 and say, if you give it to the inmates, they won't trouble you. So I, I went there, I went and gave the $10 to the inmates, but by the time I called my name to the inmates, everyone said, oh, but if you come to jail, then who will free us? Because the people that you will expect to free us. The inmates were very nice to me. I got a sheet of paper, wrote all the names down. There were about 42 inmates. And some of them were looking terrible. I saw a 14-year-old boy. I don't know whether he survived after I left. But they were feeding them with one tablespoon of farina a day and a cup of water. When I got in, in the cell, they told me the CIC in the cell, who was an army lieutenant who had been arrested, for stealing somebody's cell phone, he visited me just three or four months ago. They told me that two persons had been buried on that day who were taken out of this police cell and they died from hunger because they were getting one tablespoon of farina a day. Everyone was in jail except for a few because they were quote unquote dissident collaborators. What was happening at that time, and all of them said they were arrested by SOD4. They were going in the street, they would see young people, young men, they would arrest them, they would bring them. And if your parents or relatives were to bring 1,000 Liberian dollars, they would free you. Once they brought 1,000 Liberian dollars, you ceased from being a dissident collaborator and, were, and was free. But many of the people in detention uh, were missing action. Their parents did not know that they were in detention, so they couldn't even freedom. So I said, well, I'll write your names. I believe I'll be free tomorrow because there's enough pressure in this town to free me tomorrow and I will file a petition for a if the couples for you and I will free all of you. So I took off for the two inmates' name. At about seven o'clock or thereabout, they detained three young men. And they brought them in and they said, oh, the judge detained us for nighting. And I was explaining, I was lecturing to the fellows about different things, about law and all of that. I was sitting around, like, you know, telling them a story. And then they said, but write our name down so you can free us too. I said, but you just got detained today. On the law, after 48 hours, they will get fired for you because all these other people have been here three weeks, some people, one month. So, you know, but I will write your name now just so that if you stay alone, we can release you. Then he said, I said, what are the rest of you put for? They just arrest her, they say, one man say, one money changer say, we took his money, so three hours took his money, so they put us in jail. They did not know why the three security officers had been detained. Later on, the other one, the guy called Stephen Colley, told me, I said, what's your name? He said, my name is Stephen Colley, and that's the only name I remember. He said, I was a member of LPC, uh, working with Ruth Attila. Then, after the election, I joined o SOD. Huge guy. He said, I joined SOD, so I'm with SOD. He said everything about himself. And they were friendly with me up to 10 30. At 10 30, I heard Saboli in the police station talking loud. He came close to the cell and he sent one fellow, I think his name is Joseph Colley, as he was in the police force and an assistant to Paul Moba. Sent him to the cell to bring these three gentlemen upstairs. When these three gentlemen were upstairs, huh, when they came back, they were total beasts. The same guy that had been friendly with me started kicking me and saying, stand up. You think we don't know you are a dissident collaborator? You all want to overthrow our old man and take out a job that you can't sit down and be talking about law business? You think we don't know him or his lawyer or what? 
take out your clothes. Take out your shirt. Take out your brief. They took me in the in the restroom attached to that cell that was filled with urine and ordered me to step in the urine and told me to pump tight. I did that. I, rec I counted up to 2,000 and I couldn't count anymore. I couldn't make it. I collapsed in that urine of all these inmates. It went on until I believe 1 o'clock because he looked at his watch and said it was 1 o'clock. The huge guy. At some point around 1 o'clock, I, I, when I, I, was I saw myself lying on the ground and there was sweat all over me and there was wax, kind of wax all over me. And what happened was that apparently I passed out and to revive me, they were using hot candle wax to revive me. So when I came through, I just saw candle wax all over me. He said, oh, hey, you, you joking? We're finished with you yet. Anyway, I'm tired and I will resume in the morning. At six o'clock, two to so his word to resume. And we're in the basement, so it was still dark. I couldn't sleep that whole night. I stayed up and I heard people crying in the courtyard. You would hear somebody crying, crying, and then the noise would just cease. I was wondering whether people were being killed in the in the in the garage area the whole night. And in the morning, the lawyers, I didn't know the lawyers had come. People are packing the police station and people are there standing up for me. Everyone. So it must have been around 9 o'clock. By 7.30, a bunch of death squad, uh, what they call this guy from Nimba, uh, Miller, one Miller, and the, uh, somebody identified him later on as that. And many of them were around me now. And they were all touched. They were just knocking me. I couldn't stand up then. The ligaments here had loosened up. I couldn't stand up. So um, they came and said that I was sent for to continue the investigation that I started the day earlier to explain what had happened in Conakry. So I thought I could get up. I, had, I held the iron railing to get up. Once I let, let the iron railing, I collapsed. They tried to they put my clothes on me and the t-shirt. And I held the iron railing. And uh, right by the cell, Councillor Verdier, uh, Councillor Clark, and Councillor Jim Zuta had come down to sort of escort me upstairs because they wanted to come and tell the jailer that I had been told to go upstairs. When I let the railing to work with her, I collapsed. That when they knew it was serious, so Zuta put me on his back, and the rest of them followed. They took me upstairs, and then they started the investigation. But then, you know, my eyes were swollen. I was totally in bad shape. So all members of the bar said, this man will not face investigation until he's properly treated. It reminded me about what I said in 1978 about this guy who was in jail, in the same police cell. So all members of the bar, the bar leadership, they, they, they felt, everybody said he will not say a word. And so, Paul Mabba said, all right. In fact, when I got there, only thing I said, I was torturing the cell. Can you investigate? And when the investigating officer, I think, was going to join you, they going to say, all right, let's send to the, to the cell to call. I called the name of the guy, and, and I said he would identify the other two. So somebody called him from the decks. They went outside. I came back. He said, oh, okay, we'll deal with that one later on. But we'll start the investigation. That's when the bar insisted, no, this man must go to the hospital. Comes of right here. And Clark and, and Zuta helped me manage for me to walk and get down to the stairs. They got an ambulance. A doctor Brown got in an ambulance with me who went to the to SD Cooper. By this time, Bishop Francis, everybody is up in arms, moving up and down. Sheikh Kafumba, everybody. So I got to this to the hospital. They did x-ray and found that my, my kidneys were two black dots. Terrible. I have been injured and after i left the cell i couldn't go to latrine i couldn't pass urine and and i was seeing the carrier because i couldn't walk they took me upstairs when i got us i was surprised that with sod and our attempt to demonstrate when taylor had closed the star radio 
Uh, I think PUL wanted to demonstrate and said, anybody who mommy didn't bore him right, but I stepped there will see that Liberian people would, would be so brave to come to the police station with SOD and ATU. And uh, I, I just, I was, it brought tears in my eyes. I was just so grateful that Liberian, Liberians could stand up against all odds and at least stand up for one of them. <clears throat> so I said to myself, wow. Then I got to the hospital and people started coming. People started coming. That night, there's a police officer that I'm indebted to. He sent one young police officer that was with him downstairs to tell me something. I was lying with the, the IV flu on me. And it was like 5 o'clock going to 6 o'clock. He said, Counselor, don't let the two of us sleep with you here tonight. We have instructions. He said, insist that members of your family sleep with us in this room. He said, don't also sleep with this IV fluid on you. One person's needle perforating this thing, you are gone. Don't let it sleep. He said, don't take any tablet that is a capsule. Because there are some people in this hospital on government payroll who will open the capsule, <clears throat> put slow poison, and if you don't die in your hospital, you eventually die. That night, it made me suspicious of all the nurses. Here am I, pain all my, my body, I'm trying to get well, and I get this. How do I trust the medication in a the hospital? There was a Filipino doctor who was very good, he was looking after me, but I was suspicious of all the nurses. So, at night, there was this nurse who came, he brought, she brought laces, which is something that makes you urinate, and then paracetamol, then she brought amoxicillin, which is a capsule. I said, I'm not taking medicine. And she said, oh, they say you're hired, you hemorrhoid, but there's not code, there's hospital, you have to follow our instruction. And somehow the idea came to me and said, all right, after I couldn't succeed in the argument, I said, okay, bring me water. So she turned her back to bring the water. I let the two capsules drop under the bed. She, the laces, I knew it, our tablet, not capsule, and the paracetamol. So when she brought it, I drank the other tablets down. And, uh, and the next morning, before she could bring it, I sent my younger brother. I gave the tablet to my brother. I said, keep it. You no, know, I say, and I explained it to them, so he kept the tablet. Then he came to Sherry Pharmacy and bought me a jar of amoxicillin. The same 500 uh, milligrams. So every time they prescribe, they brought the medicine around, I would do the same trick on every day. And she did not discover that I was playing that trick until I left the hospital. And I would, once they leave, I would take the amoxicillin that I would bought. So my only regret is that when I left the hospital family and asked my brother for those tablets because I wanted a test to be done, he said, I threw it away out of the window. I said, Why did you? He said, I didn't want to make any mistake. You know, to keep it and then mistakenly give it to you. So that police officer really, really saved my life because I don't know what would have happened if, and then some of my family members, about 11 of them or so, slept in that room running shift. When some people are sleeping, others are up. That's how they kept for the one week or so I spent in the hospital. I connected to that to my direct arrest beyond suspicion because was while I was in the hospital he gave a press conference and said if you think you're so going to bring a bar lawyer around here and Charles Gamgetina cannot detain you you are, excuse me, you are a damn liar now yeah, you are free yourself I will not release Councilor Gongolo under any kind of international pressure so I smiled and my mother was in the hospital and said, oh, president can use them fool and looking at words. I said, well, that's your president because a lot of our people up in Nimba were MPP and they used to tell me, why am I opposing this man who keep the freedom and all of that? So I smiled. I said, I'm smiling because the president is acknowledging that there is pressure coming from somewhere so I know I will be free. So then two days after that press conference, I was told to be discharged. In fact, one day, they had said I should be discharged and I couldn't walk. So I told the doctor, 
Why should I be discharged? Look, I'm a foreigner in this country, and they could revoke my license if I keep insisting that you should stay. I don't think you are well. So anyway, later on, he said, I can't keep you any further. I have to discharge because I don't want to fall in, in political trouble. The good thing about it is that he had put everybody out one day, including my people, and told me that his uncle was a human rights lawyer in the Philippines on a Marcus, and his uncle was one of those people who uh, agitated against Marcus. So he felt personally connected to me, and he did that. So when they, they discharged me from the hospital, I was taken to the police station. I was asked the same questions. Why did I say that the 1989 uh, conflict was brought by, the war was brought by some evil-minded Liberians? Why did I say that the Market Association was a cherry squad? And I said, these were my answers that I remember. I said, a war that led to brothers killing brothers had little virtues about it, and it could, it could have only been brought by evil-minded people. And I maintain it. I said, tell me anything virtuous about the war that would make me change and say that it was not brought by evil-minded people. So I, mean, I, wrote, I, wrote, I wrote that. I said, that's history, and I can't change history. That's exactly what happened. And then I said, yes, the Market Association has been cherry squatting our country from time immemorial. Why do you want me to change this? And I must say, a, a good number of CID persons ran away from my case, including the head of CID at the time, Lemuel Reeves. He didn't want to be associated with my case. The current director of CID want, didn't want to be associated with my, my case, Zago. So it was done by other, other persons. They, they knew me. I just didn't feel it was necessary to treat me the, the way that I was treated. So they kept away. In fact, the CID officer who investigated me took my statement and I underlined it and I said I, I need copies of my statement. He refused. And I told the director of CID, let me read. I said, you, are, you just left law school. If I don't get copies of my statement, I will object to your admission to the bar. And he said, no, 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 no. I don't want trouble. Give the man his statement. So he gave me my statement. And then, uh, subsequently, I spent a week or two at home and Carter Center invited me to go observe elections in uh, Freetown as they have done now for me to go to Ghana. And I went to the airport with Councilor Francis Johnson, Mor Francis Johnson Morris, who was also going to observe elections. She had been invited. We stood in line, we passed through immigration and everything. And I saw these two guys with dark shades. I asked the immigration intelligence officer at the airport whether I was blacklisted. He said no. Because I wanted to find out, I didn't want him to be embarrassed. He said no. So I was on the line, I checked in, and they said, You are needed by the president in town. They arrested me and brought me back to town. Took me to, that time I was still working with the can. Took me to NSA and detained me. So as we were going, Carter kind of Center coming from Atlanta, I said, Are you on the plane going to Freetown? I said, No, I'm on a vehicle going back to jail. And they told BBC and sent it all over the place. And then messages started coming back to the, to the government, and by the end of the day, I was released through the intervention of Bishop Francis, who sent Councillor Copper to sign for me. So Bishop Francis said, look, I think Taylor is afraid that if you go to Sierra Leone, the press will be all on you, and you'll be exposed. So just sit down here. So I, I sat in Monrovia. Until one day, the inter-religious group went to meet Taylor. He had said that he was not going to talk law and all of that, but I think Addington had been attacked, and the attack was coming closer. So he called the inter-religious council, and it is my understanding that after the meeting, when, they, when he had to say what he said, they appealed to him to let me leave the country to go for medical treatment, because at the hospital, when the laces got me to finally uh, pass urine, my urine was as black as this table because of the injury that I had suffered. And that's when I was really afraid, not of the beating, but that internal injury. And then I was treated until the urine changed color a little bit. So I needed to go for proper medical treatment out of the country. So they pleaded, and finally Taylor agreed. When Bishop Francis was coming from the meeting, he called me and said, do you have your things packed? I said, oh, Taylor said he likes you and this and that. And 
and you are free to leave the country. I left the country two days later. But that night, Louis Brown called me around 11 o'clock and said, the president wants to see you. I said, 11 o'clock in the night? He said, yes, he's president of the country and can see you any time of the day and any time of the night. I said, not what I've been through. I will not see the president alone in the night. I can see the president in a day only on condition that Bishop Francis and and she confirmed and, the, and she confirmed by present. So yeah, if that's what you want, that's what will happen. But uh, we can arrange a meeting tomorrow. I, I said, but you know, I'm happy that he has finally allowed me to leave, and I'm preparing to leave to go for medical treatment. He said, but that's what we're calling you for now. We don't want to hurt you. We want to give you money for medical package. I became furious, and I said, Luis, tell President Taylor I don't want a dime from him. I don't want one cent from him. My friends abroad will treat me. It's not everybody in this country that has a price. I don't want a dime from Taylor. Next morning, I went to the bar office and told a bunch of lawyers that you guys should be ready to fight for me because Taylor is about to give me money and I wouldn't take it. Anyway, I didn't see Taylor. I headed for the airport that day and up to the time I got on the wastewater plane, I felt that because I didn't go to see Taylor, I would have been rearrested. I took my two children out. My wife was in Ghana studying at University of Lebanon. So I left with the children in my house, my two children plus my sister-in-law, and we flew to Africa since we didn't have enough money and went by road to Ghana. In Ghana, the Americans arranged for ticket, for visas for my family. I was given visa, they got visa, and Amnesty International paid for the tickets and Universal Human Rights helped to pay for my ticket, and my family relocated to the United States. I must express thanks to a whole lot of people for that, uh, for my survival. Besides the bar and librarian people that stood up, the human rights group, the press carried headlines on my case on a daily basis until I was released. Everyone in the press leaving nobody out. And the ordinary librarians who raised their lives to come to the police station, to come to the hospital to see me. Later on, some of them called me a United States that we had to prepare asylum paper for. Who said because they visited, visited me in the hospital, they were called to MBI, they were called to NSA, and they were harassed. There was a young man who, because someone took my picture at the hospital and appeared on the internet, and he was a rare cross guy and he was a photographer but he was not the one that took my photograph it was someone else who smoking a, a camera and took my photograph and put it on the internet and Taylor accused this fellow he had to go into exile and only came to Liberia after he heard a comeback and that's when he came from Guinea two days later when he came from Guinea he came to my office and explained his story I could just tell him I'm sorry so a lot of people who stood up for me also suffered you know, just to see me, people suffered. And I want to, to express regret for all of them. I want to thank them, all of them, for standing up for me. The American government did extremely well. I didn't know all of this. I knew Human Rights Watch popularized my detention. Uh, Amnesty International Day and all the human rights groups. As the American embassy told me later on, there were 150 requests from around the world for my uh, uh, release. But when at the Congress, I was called at the hearing of the Human Rights Committee and the congressman from uh, New Jersey, um, I forgot his black congressman, said that I think about 20 congressmen wrote the State Department uh, requesting the State Department to intervene to make sure that, I, that nothing, nothing happened to me. I, I was really pleased that a whole lot of people stood for me. But one thing that I have to mention, there was an old man, a, a poor man who came to my law office and wanted me to take his, his land case and on that day I was really, really broke. And I said, look, I'm tired of being a poor, man, poor man's lawyer. Everybody, all is in the newspaper, everybody lawyer of the year, this and that, him or a lawyer of the year, but I'm poor, I can't take care of my family, man. I came from the same law school that these uh, uh, lawyers who are accomplished I came from, you know, 
I'm not in an outstanding lawyer in my view because I can't provide adequately for my family. So the woman said, look, he sat me now, he said, let me tell you, some of the lawyers you're talking about can't walk the street, but you can walk the street. And you are an accomplished lawyer, I can tell you that. Because you got something that a lot of people don't have. Some of those people need security to walk the street because they're always taking cases against workers and all of that. So for me, you're an outstanding lawyer. I said, you're just trying to cajole me to take your case. It was not two weeks after this thing happened to me. The old man was attending Bethel Church, I went, and he brought his whole group of Bethel people to sing and pray for me at the hospital. And he said, if you look outside now, there are about 2,000 people just waiting to see you, people standing out for you. Which one of those lawyers you call will have had that kind of situation with people standing up for them? So in my view, you are an accomplished lawyer. That's what he told me. I went to the States, and then I've explained how I came back and joined the interim government, and the rest is history. But concluding, I have some observations about Liberian history. Some of it I said earlier, and I just want to read that out. I have fairly summarized what I have in my statement, unless you ask me some specific questions. But I think that our conflict, one, I believe that our conflict evolved as a result of exclusion and discrimination from participation in the political affairs of this country. Throughout our history from 1847 to present, there have been various manif manifestations of exclusion and discrimination. The one that exists today is what is evolving, a new dichotomy is evolving. There are librarians who are saying, librarians are coming from abroad and taking their jobs. Even though they are librarians, that other dichotomy is evolving, and we ought to watch out for that. The qualified librarians who are coming from abroad are, are being told that they are not they are not to take a job, or for them to get a job is becoming a political problem. That it will, it, and, and, and that's it's an alert that is coming in the paper that we need to watch out for. Because when it keeps growing, and there are over 200,000 librarians in America, and maybe half of them, or even 10% of them might decide to come with various skills. This could be a new dichotomy that could be a source of conflict. Two, suppression of freedom of expression. I believe that suppression of freedom of expression has had a major contribution to our conflict through our history. Uh, look, I, 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 the late Tuan Ray was arrested in 1955 as a young journalist, because he wrote something about the government that he felt, he felt the legislature was weak and it was being controlled by the executive, they grabbed him and put him in jail. When his editor, Bertha Corbin, also made the same statement the next day because she was an American married to a Liberian, and at that time the immigration law was that once you are married to a Liberian, you are a Liberian citizen automatically. Chopper changed the law in order to deport Bertha Corbin because she was editor. The, the final five thousand dollars or so, Thomas said, "I'm not sufficient. They will to pay the money." So when, it, when he talked about deportation, he said, "But yeah, the statute. They changed the statute, and even though our laws on our constitution cannot go retroactively, Bertha, Bertha Corbin was deported out of Liberia, and that's one of the things we have to take in the law reform process." Because from the time Bertha Corbin was deported up to now, our immigration law is still, uh, is still that way. That marriage is not sufficient to give you citizenship. That adjustment was made because of an action against freedom of expression. Then, one thing that is normal is that in this country, all regimes, when you are singing the praises of the government in power, they even patronize you. When you speak the truth to power or express a view that is different from the view of those in government, you become public enemy and actions are taken against you. And, and that action is protected by some other laws. As Solicitor General, I say I will never enforce any of those laws. And in places where some of our officials have tried to use it, I have told my county attorney, please enter another press court. Laws that criminal money violence. That law, criminal malevolence, when I was doing research, I have a, I research. It is no more a legal term in modern law dictionary. How can we, a country called Liberia, keep an arcade law 
that does not exist in a modern law dictionary to use it to contain speech. Then the sedition law came out in 1914. After Barclay had uh, integrated the country a little bit and other people were coming out and speaking, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, after Barclay, and other people were coming out and speaking out, they brought a sedition law. And the sedition law was trending under Barclay. Uh, the other Barclay, Edwin J. Barclay. Because Albert Port and T.J. R. Fogner, who had lost election to uh, Charles D.B. King and others, had reported about the fanatical crisis and that had led to the government in which Edwin J. Bagley was Secretary of State being brought down, causing them to resign. But for further reading, I don't think Bagley was angry because uh, President King and his Vice President Yancey resigned. I think there was a personal reason. Bagley and Bagley Law Firm was a law firm from the Spanish company that was coming and recruiting uh, people for forced labor on the island. So he lost income. That law firm lost a big income. So even though because King and, and, the, and the Vice President had resigned, he became elevated from Secretary of State to, to becoming President overnight, he lost personal income and was unhappy about that. So in 1932, when he appeared before the legislature, he said that we must tighten the sedition law. Because you got all kind of people here taking issues that is a matter of, is a matter of national concern and letting other people who got no business to know about it, knowing about it. Because that's how the fanatical crisis investigation started because the League of Nations was informed. So the history of a law like sedition is not a good law. We shouldn't keep it on our book. And I've said to some of my partners, my friends, that that's one of the laws that in the law reform process will get out of the book. We cannot be building democracy and have these laws that curtail speech. If you read the, the sedition law, even reports sent out of this country by human rights group is seditious. Anytime you read anything to a foreign government or a foreign group about something that happens that you have committed sedition. So the law is so bad that even past governments have sparingly, sparingly used it. They only use it for political reasons because had they been using it, a whole lot of people would have been in jail for, for sedition. So it's the same thing with criminal libel against the president. Criminal libel, look at criminal malevolence. It says, if you say anything against any member of the executive, any member of the judiciary, or, or the legislature, which is untrue, then you have committed a first degree uh, misdemeanor. As for, for sedition, a second degree felony, a very high offense. Then there is another law called criminal libel, libel against the president. If you say anything about the president that affects his office, and we can say now her office, and it is untrue, you have committed criminal libel against the president. But you know when you know it's untrue, you are already in jail, and it is only a trial that it will be known that it's untrue. Maybe you spend a, a year in jail or several months in jail. Those are not good laws as we are building democracy. I have seen great democracy like the United States. And many people have been there, even out of 9-11. People are reading documentary and books to say Bush lie. This was Bush mani uh, uh, manipulation. There was just a, 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 an idea by the Republicans to scare the Americans so they can stay in power. All of those speeches have their place in the democracy. There are other people who are saying Bush was right, He's a great patriot. He protected America. He did the right thing. That view counters the other view. All of them have a space in the political life of the United States, and we must behave similarly to avoid peace in this country. I mean, a conflict in this country and to promote peace. Corruption. Corruption has affected our country for decades. Look, out of the the, the crisis that led to the removal of E.J. Roy, he had gone to London to get a loan. And his Secretary of State, Hillary Roy Richard Johnson, had come back and said that loan is not a good loan for our country. There are all kinds of percentages, and by the time we get paid, we'll not even get anything out of it. There was, a, there was a belief that the loan process itself and the whole loan was, was just a product of corruption. 
And in the end, our president in 1871 was removed. You know, people keep saying 1980 was the first coup. The first coup, as you have heard, many people say in the historians that come before you, was in 1871. And it was not a bloodless coup. It was a bloody coup. Why? The Republicans, led by Joseph Jenkins Roberts, had their men, their machetes, they had the people shooting all over the place. The supporters of President E.J. Roy, his, according to history, were also shooting. Later on, against the Constitution, instead of impeaching the men, they met somewhere in Monrovia, and those of uh, legislators opposed to Roy wrote a manifesto. And here is what they say in the manifesto. manifesto. From this day on, President E.J. Roy is hereby deposed. That's a coup d'etat. President E.J. Roy is hereby deposed as, as president of Liberia. What happened to the Constitution? And then they put him on trial for treason. So a jailer that he appointed, he told the jailer, he said, please let me go. The jailer said, go. I see a Bahimi Cassell wrote his history book. When he got to the one side, it may have been Slipway or West Point or one of the places there, they grabbed him and dragged him in the street of Monrovia and they put him back in jail and he bled to death. Then they write in history that so he was doing that he drowned. The proper history has to be I read all of this when I was doing my research at Harvard. There are over 3,000 entries on Liberia and all I was doing was reading the history I had not read in Liberia. The man bled to death. That was a bloody coup. And they say, oh, he drowned. Where some you are going and some trying to get in a crew canoe and he drowned. That is a lie. It's not true. Then, after that, all of the legislators and members of the government who were members of the True Party ran away from Monroe. They went into hiding. The vice president, Jim Smith, went to Buchanan in hiding because he was from Grand Bassa. They established an interim government of white looking Liberian, light skinned people. One of them was called uh, Reginald Sherman. Reginald Sherman had a, when you look at a picture, had a hair like Joseph Jenkins Roberts, you know, like he was an octoron, meaning, meaning about 25% black blood. General, he was a general in the militia. General Reginald Sherman was a member. There was a Fulton Dumba who was a member. There were three, I've forgotten the, the third person. In it. There were three member interim government, like a council, established after the deposed EJ Roy. And there was an interim government, they call it in the literature, interim government. They served for a few months and then they realized that no, we can't go this way. Let's send for Jim Smith. They sent for Jim Smith. They sent for the other legislators who were members of the Tory Party. They came back. And when Jim Smith took over, he gave a very critical speech that condemned both his, his late boss, Ijiro, because Ijiro was trying to extend his stay by putting something in the ballot and say, the way you voted, it means that I got four years. They said, no, your two years are ended. He said, no, no. After you voted, it means I, I, got, I got two years. You didn't see the ballot. And at the same time, there was a controversy over the, the loom that the felt that he had benefited from. Then, this thing happened, so when he came, he said that his boss was wrong for trying to extend his stay in power that way. But also those who were opposed to him were wrong because his removal was unlawful, was against the constitution. You don't meet and write a manifesto and depose a president of Liberia. That's not what the 1847 constitution said. He gave that speech. And then, as you can see, what happened later on was that Joseph Jenkins Roberts, after the election, came right back. So, corruption, when, you, when, when reporters report about corruption, then they arrest them. That is what human rights, that, that, that's the source of the human rights abuse. Because those in power, when you talk about corruption, they get angry, and then they go and they arrest and detain those people who speak, they jail the journalists, the closed down newspaper, all of that. So we have to get rid of corruption. Lack of respect for, for rule of law. In this country for a long time, the application of the law has been selected. So one of the challenges of this government and all is to make sure that there's equal protection 
of all librarians under the law, there's equal application of the law. The ordinary people have seen a lot of people being selectively treated. There are some people who have been above the law, as happened for a long time in this country, and has undermined the, the if, effectiveness of the law because people say, well, some people are above the law, so why, what kind of law is it? I don't respect the law. So lack of respect for rule of law has been part of the reason we've had conflict. A general lack of respect for human rights. We saw it coming to the fore in this war. If we had a cultural respect for human rights, some of the things that happened in this war on all sides of the war in fashion will not have happened. Then, number six, a low level of formal education. A lot of people are being manipulated in this country by, every, by, a, lot of, by a few enlightened people and by a few people who don't mean well, the warring factions and all of that. Those who fought the war were less enlightened are people who didn't, most of them didn't go to school, didn't finish high school. And so, lack of formal education makes a lot of people in this country vulnerable for manipulation. Then also librarians always want a quick fix solution. Just as they did in 1871, we're saying let's issue manifesto. We'll go start impeachment and hearing. This man will bring lawyer. Maybe at the end he will stay there because there will be all kinds of things. So let's just move. All of our problems in this country from 1847 and all of our political problem, problems, we always want a quick solution. Quick fix. And Part of the reason is that those in power and opposition politicians are always promising magical solutions to problems. So when, they, when, when, when people come to power, our people are always looking for magical solutions. Uh, because when there's, even when something is happening, when the gap between expectation for freedom is widening and nothing is happening, people say there's failure here, we have to take action, quick action. Then opposition, the nature of opposition politics in Liberia, that's my count. It is bad. Politics in Liberia is viewed as enmity, is viewed as a conflict to the extent that opposing sides consider themselves to be enemies and not opponents. Instead of taking each other to be, I have a better view, a better strategy for dealing with a Liberian problem, they take each other as enemies to the extent that even when elections are over, until the ne next elections, the opponents remain enemies until the next election. i tell you a story. In 1988 or thereabout, one of my colleagues, I think Ghana came to play Liberia. I was preparing to go on the football field. I don't usually go, but Opo and others were coming to play, and I wanted to go on the field. I said, maybe we'll beat Liberia today. And my friend said, I was saying, why am I happy about Liberia beating? I said, why? He said, my man, since Samuel do likes football, I want Liberia to be defeated. So you can feel bad. That's how he told opposition politics that Liberia, the lone star, must be defeated because our opponent was in power. As light as it looks, that is how people take opposition politics in this country. After election, it should be over. That's why I think the best politics in Liberia takes place on Universal Liberia campus. After elections, the soup and same people shake hands and they are going, they are going to the same classes, they are normal. Even when we were there with ASA, inside soup, we do internal criticism. We used to do internal criticism. We have a, a scrutiny section where you want to be president or uh, you want to run a soup ticket. If you are corrupt in high school, we'll bring it. Somebody from your class will bring it. And you will not represent soup. And even then, we'll still be friends. Here, on the national scene, People are thin skin and, and it's making people not to analyze because you are afraid that your analysis will mean you are against someone. It, it affects the country because it's making people not to be analytical, not to be intellectually developed because they don't want to offend people. That goes against our country. And I think all librarians must be instructed, all librarian politicians must be instructed by the recent American opposition politics. They want to brought Barack Obama to power. And the way Barack Obama is trying to re is trying to constitute his government, the way he's meeting with McCain, the way he's trying to put people who were his opponents, not enemies, to rebuild them, to, 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 to strengthen the American economy, to move America forward. 
it is the nation they look at national interest and not personal interest. Then we have had governance by fear, violence, and intimidation from 1847 to now. That must be stopped. Governments must be respected and not fear. We've had a situation where all governments have always made the people afraid. And when the people become afraid, they distance themselves from the government in power and don't feel that the government in power represents them. So the whole politics of fear and intimidation and violence have to end in this country. So I've suggested that there must be national policies against discrimination and exclusion to the constitution constitutional provision of freedom of, of expression must be observed at all times by the government and people of Liberia. And anti-speech laws, like criminal malevolence, sedition, and criminal libel against the president should be repealed. There is no place for those kind of laws in a democracy. On the issue of corruption, our country needs stronger laws on corruption. Since corruption has been declared by the government of Liberia as public enemy number one, our legislature should enact stronger laws against corruption in the same way that it strengthened the armed robbery law that has reduced armed robbery in our country. Armed robbery was made a first degree felony with no right to criminal appearance born, and most of the armed robbers or the leading armed robbers were arrested and detained, and the place is quiet. We will try them, but at least before we try them, they are there. For Article 11 of the Constitution of Liberia provides for equal treatment before the law. The government of Liberia must at all times remain committed to the application of this provision of the Constitution and make sure that the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive branches adhere to this provision of the Constitution. Nobody should be above the law. For some people to be above the law undermines the law. On the issue of human rights, the Constitution of Liberia contains several articles on human rights. The provision must be the provisions of Chapter Three of the Constitution must be taught in Liberian schools. Also, officials of government must read these constitutional provisions on human rights. Six, for many years to come, the government of Liberia should put money into primary and secondary education with the view of providing free secondary education for all Liberians. This is the best way to combat ignorance. An ignorant population is easily manipulated and to have a large ignorant population is risky. It's a source of conflict. It will make our peace fragile. Our, our, our peace fragile. Serving on the issue of the impatience of Liberian people, politicians and the government of Liberia must all time be truthful to the Liberian people in their analysis of national problems and promises of solutions so that people don't expect that nations can be built or rebuilt uh, by some magical solution. Eight, on the issue of opposition politics and governance by fear, violence, and intimidation, Liberian politicians and people in government must always take into consideration that every Liberian has equal share in the corporation called Liberia. Nobody has any share higher. And those in government don't have a greater share than those outside government. There must at all times be mutual respect amongst politicians in and out of government. Liberian politicians must learn from the most recent examples of opposition pol uh, part, uh, politics in the United States. Finally, it is important for all Liberians to know that Liberia as a state was established on the principles of respect for human rights and was meant to be a human rights paradise. This is the only country called Liberia on planet Earth, meaning land of liberty. Liberia was meant to be a source of hope for all oppressed people and an example of self-governance by black people. It is the betrayal 
the failure to live up to these dreams as a nation that led to over two decades of violent conflict in Liberia. In our rebuilding process, we must always take into consideration the dreams upon which Liberia was established as a nation in Africa. Thank you very much. Sirs, if you can let me, just before you begin your questioning, as all the things will never come, I remember in, 19, in 2002, just before going to Guinea, I was one of the four lawyers called before the Liberian Senate to testify like this on the Status of Forces Agreement, on the uh, arms embargo on the sanction and the uh, uh, emergency emergency power and I wrote a six page paper one of the things I said in the paper which I strongly believe was the source of my arrest later on that the speech I delivered it was I told the senators that in 1930 the senators were all members of the Tory party and when the League of Nations charged President King and his Vice President guilty of abuse of slave, of selling slave labor, selling slave labor to Fernando Po, and they wanted to make Liberia a protectorate of the League of Nations, mandated somehow and reduce our sovereignty, the senators called President King and said, Mr. President, Your Excellency, you have been our president for 11 years, and we love you. But the time has come for us to choose between Liberia and you, because we will not allow our sovereignty to be reduced by one minute, by one inch. After the Senate was clear to President King, he resigned, followed by his Vice President. When I said that, looking at the Senators, I said, do you want to tell me that 72 years later, our senators are less nationalistic and patriotic than the senators of 1930. Because for over two years, you and I was announcing that Taylor was involved in Sierra Leone, and you did not find it as an important national duty to invite Taylor here to ask him, this is what the UN is saying. What are you saying? At least to brief you as representative of the court. You failed to do that, and you have a right in the interest of the people to impeach President Taylor if it goes against the interests of the Liberian people. You did not do it. I believe by mentioning impeachment, I think Taylor was right by that. But then uh, I prevented my immediate arrest by asking the President Pro Tempo at the time, Kekra Pro said, before I speak, I want a guarantee from here that I'm protected, I'm immune by Article 32, just like your that you put here, that anything you say, I say here will be immune. If you agree, then I'll move on. And the thing was like, this, the, the testimony was like. So when they say, yes, you are immune, before I read my prepared statement. And I believe, you know, President Taylor used to pretend to be law abiding, so his legislator has said that I was immune. I was not arrested there. But I was not immune for the statement, statement in Guinea. So I believe that I had follow me because when you compare my statement before the Senate and the one in Guinea, Anybody will say the one before the Senate was sufficient to anger Mr. Taylor. I would just want to say that. Thank you very much, Mr. Witness, for your presentation, which took us back as far back as 1976, straight up to 2002, based upon your personal experiences, what you have heard, what has happened to you, and all of that. Beyond that, you managed to advance a couple of recommendations that you think our new society should adapt to and the TRS should take that into consideration when it is making its recommendations so that we have a society founded on free speech, human rights, and equity 
honor the Lord and also to avoid some of the mistakes of the past. I want to thank you very much for your presentation. It is now time for questions and answers. But with your indulgence, the Commission will want to continue these proceedings tomorrow morning so that we can continue uh -huh. with question and answer. Can, uh, The money I have, hour is not you know, I have a small problem. You know, I could have appeared a long time, but as part of my problem, you know, appearing before the Supreme Court, of course, all the time. I have a nine o'clock engagement before the Supreme Court tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I I believe that, and then I have a two thirty case before the civil law court on the um, search warrant that we issued for the asset freeze that was questioned by. The, some of the parties. Will you be uh, uh, and will you be in good shape to continue with the commission after those two engagements? Yeah. Okay. I, I I'm prepared to come here like I believe by three ten. The okay. should be over. Then we're waiting yeah, yeah, the yeah. commission. That would be fine for me. Okay, sir. Then we'll continue tomorrow with your question and answering by three thirty tomorrow. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you sir. <laughs> Mr Herald sir we stand adjourned till ten tomorrow morning. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Now we're joined today and we'll be here tomorrow. Thank you very much.